So when we think about, you know, authentic communication, the first thing that comes to mind, the first thing that comes to mind is um, is the commercial where there's this little kid in the in the in a shopping cart and his mom with his mom and then there's this older gentleman that's kind of behind them and you can see the little kid is looking at the man and he's looking at him and you can see the kind of wheels turning and the mom with a little bit of horror on her face like oh my goodness what is my son about to say um and then he was like your face looks weird and so that mom is like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's what I think about when I think about authentic communication. Children are the most authentic communicators that we know. No, I am not saying to go out and start calling people, telling people that their face looks weird. Let's not do that. We're not trying to start any fights at the grocery store. But what that teaches us is as we mature, as we get older, as we get some more social decorum and, and etiquette, we realize we do need to edit ourselves. So when we talk about authentic communication, this is not necessarily to say that we're going to, that you want to go out and, and offend people because I got to speak my truth and tell me exactly, tell me exactly, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what's on my mind and how I feel about this situation, situation, I'm going to be direct and to the point. That is not necessarily authentic communication. You can have authentic communication and not offend people. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So when we think about authentic communication and how that can happen for us, I think about, I also think about an iceberg because above that waterline is what people see when we're talking to them. They see or hear our words. They hear that tonality. They, hear, they see that body language. They see our gestures. So that's what we show people is um, when we're communicating with them, we show them what's above the waterline. But what is really driving all of that they see and hear really falls below the waterline, which is our beliefs, our values, our biases, our, pre our prejudices, our experience, our dreams, our feelings, all of those things are what is driving that body language. So when I'm sitting there with my arms crossed or when I'm, you know, kind of rolling my eyes, you know, when you're talking, it could, it's probably it's, it's what's underneath my biases of what, you, of what you're saying, my belief in what you're saying. So if I'm not believing that you're coming from a true authentic place, then we don't really have that authentic communication. So let's talk about, you know, what do you think? And go ahead and type in what do you think are some of the obstacles that prevent us from speaking authentically to each other? Because um, we, we had that in us as a, as a child. So now why do you think we don't continue still being authentic, but with the understanding that we are adults and we have social graces that we need to, um, that, uh, the ways we need to conduct ourselves? So go ahead and type in what you think could possibly be some of the ob obstacles that stop us from that authentic communication. And so I see a lot of people typing in, being scared of getting in trouble or hurting others' feelings. That's right on, Angela. Fear of ridicule. That's perfect, Diane. Thank you so much. Oh, Janae, people are, are, are typing in. They're going to take that gold star. Lack of trust. That is exactly right, Roy. Those are some of the obstacles that we see. Um, lack of trust, language barriers, perceptions from the receivers, that is, uh, all of those are perfect. Feeling that um, they won't understand, is, is there a preferred, oh, sorry about the, um, I am, uh, the preferred browser that I am using right now is Google Chrome, um, and I don't know what other people are using, so if some people, it looks like we do have Christina that may be having some difficulty signing in. Um, you can try to log out, logging back in. Um, Michelle, caring too much about what someone else thinks, the delivery of the message, all of those are excellent. Everybody, I think, kind of hit the three points that are the three main obstacles um, that hinder us from lowering that waterline and, and showing people our true selves and speaking authentic, authentically. Fear, that fear of, you know, I don't want to hurt, it could, you know, falls on both sides, the fear of I don't want to hurt people's feelings, the fear of if I say this, they might hurt my feelings. 
and the other part, and I think someone said this, is conformity. You know, we, we just, you know, we don't want to be the person at the lunch table by ourselves. We don't want to be the last person to get picked. So I just want to conform and kind of go with the masses. And so that can sometimes lead us to not being our, our authentic selves because I can't truly be me and also be with the cool kids, be with the group. So sometimes it's that conformity. Also, lack of confidence, which builds on that fear, builds on that conformity. So now I have the fear, I want to belong. So that's going to, so I may not have the confidence to kind of speak out um, and speak my truth and speak who I truly am and kind of lower that waterline. So let's talk about the, now we know, you know, the fears, the obstacles that hinder us from that authentic communication and knowing is half the battle so i know that i kind of have to overcome that fear i you know don't always be worried about being part of the group and build your confidence by speaking your truth and the way we do that is understanding the components of authentic communication and the there are five main components and we're going to talk about each of these um, as we go through the presentation. The first one is transparency. And this is when you invite trust by revealing that you have nothing to hide. The second piece is active listening. It's a, let's call active listening is more of like a structured type of listening and responding that focuses the attention on the speaker. Um, but then the listener must also take care to attend to the speaker fully. So active listening is a two-part street, and we're going to talk about that more in depthly as we uh, go through this presentation. Self-awareness, and that just means, you know, knowing your values, your behaviors, your needs, your habits, your emotions, your strengths, and your challenges. It's talking, it's, and that self-awareness is really understanding what's below that waterline. And then we're going to talk about the emotional mind and the intellectual mind. So now let's go ahead and start with taking down the walls. And that's going to be transparency. So when we think about some of the benefits of transparency, you can go ahead and type in what do you think some of those benefits are. When I say that authentic communication, a part of that is transparency. Yes, trust. That is definitely right, Vanessa. Having trust, no hidden agenda. That is perfect. Transparency means I'm being transparent. So that that is absolutely right, Karina. We want to um, let the world see us, and that can that's where sometimes that fear can come in because if I expose myself to the world, then I'm also exposing myself to possibly getting hurt. So that fear, being consistent with your message, absolutely allowing yourself to be vulnerable. That's right on, Ashley. Very good. You all are giving some awesome, amazing responses. And so when we're talking about the benefit of transparency, someone spoke about this. It builds trust. That is one of the benefits. If, if I know that you are exposing yourself then I am going to trust, I'm, that's going to help me trust you because I know you're not trying to hide anything. I know Karina said that hidden agenda. If I feel like there's something behind what you're doing, then I'm going to have my guard up as well. And if we both have our guard up, then nothing is getting through. The other benefit is it makes problem solving that much easier because now there's more than one person in the room that can say something, that can figure out what's going on because you know, while we all may think that we know everything, we really don't. And so by getting other people involved, by, you know, breaking down those walls and having everyone kind of be transparent and open up, now we're going to be able to get um, get to solve this, the problems a lot quicker because we have more brain power on it. And then when we talk about it, it increases better, it makes um, more productive teams, more productive environments. Each of the preceding points that trust, making the uh, problem solving easier, all of those points kind of take us to this better performance. Because if you add, you know, the trust, problem solving, all of that equals better performance. So now let's talk about how do we get that? How can we bring that to the table? Because I know Everybody would like to have some more transparency. And this does not mean that we have to say, we have to tell our people everything that's going on. Because I know in management, we can't always tell our people exactly 
every morsel, every single thing that's happening in those senior leadership meetings. We just can't because we haven't figured it out ourselves as leaders. So how are we going to communicate that to our team? But what you can do is not hide behind it because you know what? The employees are talking at the water cooler. They know something is going on. They may not know all the ins and outs and the whys and what fors, but the talk is going on. And we always know the talk is worse than reality because when that phone rings at 2 a.m. in the morning, you never think that it's Ed McMahon saying, hey, you just won the publisher's clearinghouse $5 million. No one thinks that someone, you know, when that phone rings, you're thinking, what, what has happened? Where are my children? Where's my husband? Where's my wife? What's going on? You, you don't think that it's going to be positive. So that's what happens with your employees when they don't have the information. So if we're not being transparent. So how can we get that? One is, you know, treat your employees like adults and be honest. I mean, that's just to the point. You can't really get any clearer than that. You know, your employees aren't fragile. I know you think some of them are and some of them are sensitive to criticism and rejection and, and that's a, a valid point. They definitely are. So, you know, it's more about how we say things, not necessarily what we're saying. So just know that your employees aren't fragile, that they're not going to break. They're going to embrace you more than break if you give them the truth. If you have nothing to, you know, if you have something to say to them, just say it. You know, there's no need to really beat around the bush too much or try to sugarcoat too much because we all can read that when you're trying to sugarcoat. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, you're trying to make roses out of this situation. If the situation isn't rosy, let's just say the situation is not rosy, but we are working towards getting that, getting the flowers back, you know, back where they need to be. So understanding that piece. And then thank you, Sean, for I, I was hoping that I got a little laugh on that comment. Um, close. Uh, the employee knowledge gap. That's another piece when we're talking about the transparency. You want to be open. You want to be honest. You want the employees to know as much as possible because your employees are the ones that are talking to clients. Your employees are the one that may um, have that little piece that you need to, to get the situation resolved because they spoke with the client and the client is seeing this. Because sometimes, especially if we've been in the business, if we've been um, in that position for a long time, things become very routine. And how many times has this happened where you've had a new employee come in and you've been doing it this way for 20 years, but then all of a sudden this new employee comes in and says, well, you know, why don't we have this on the other side? Because it would make it a lot easier. And then everybody looks around like, wow, well, why didn't we do that? That does make a lot more sense. I know I have that feeling every single time I watch Shark Tank and it's just some crazy little idea like, okay, why didn't I think of that? I mean, it makes like, yeah, we do need that. We do need to have those uh, self tying laces or the light that comes on in the bathroom. Why didn't I think of these things? So, you know, giving people information can help them come up with these being wow bright ideas because now they kind of know like if you have some initiatives that are coming down the pike send it out to your employees and say you know in 2017 we are trying to streamline our customer service um process let them you know give it out to them let them know what you're thinking that you want to do the initiatives that you want to have they may come up with some amazing ideas that will help you get there that much quicker and lastly explain your decisions you know what Let's be honest, not everything we come up with, not everything we put into motion is the right thing. And that's perfectly fine. You know, we are we are not geniuses. So it's okay, but you want to explain why you made the decision that you made, especially when you start putting it out to everyone to help you with these initiatives. We don't want, you know, people to be offended like, yeah, they they send it out, but they never take our advice. Explain why you had to make the decisions that you made, because, you know, the employees may not know that we're dealing with this budget, you know, or, or that we're dealing with this um, government rule or, you know, this standard that we have to hit. They may not know all of that, because, it, it, you know, they weren't privy to that information. They didn't need to know. We just want to get the ideas. But you want to explain your decisions as to why 
why things are the way they are, why we had to do it this way. And now, and now when you do that, now we all feel like we're all on the same page. We're all on the same team. There's not this secret society sitting in their white ivory towers, you know, making, making all these decisions and, not imp and that impact us, but they are not including us. So you want to ensure that you explain, you know, why we had to go with the decisions that we made. Transparency is a tool that few of us actually use because sometimes we're scared to share. We're scared to give them too much information like, oh, I don't want them to know that the company isn't doing well. They may try to leave us. Well, no, they actually may try to stay and help us get the company back on track because if I know that you're in the trenches with me, I'm going to be in the trenches with you and we're going to make this happen. So you want to use it to your benefit. So don't be scared of transparency. Embrace being transparent. So now how do we do this transparency piece? How do we add this? So this is the first component. We're going to get to the second component. Now I want everyone to take a piece of paper. You don't, you know, it doesn't have to be a big piece of paper. And I want you to draw a house. I'll give you a few moments to draw the house. And I'll give you a little Jeopardy music as we do this. Do, 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 do. All right, so everyone has drawn their house. Does your house look like this? Probably raise your hand if your house looks exactly like this. Nothing else added, but you have everything that I have. Okay, I see a few hands. I see a few hands. I don't see everybody's hand. And that's because we didn't have great active listening. And that is partly because me as the sender, I did not offer you the opportunity to ask questions. So this was a one-sided conversation. And if we have a one-sided conversation, we are not having an active listening situation. And that's bringing us to the second component of authentic communication. You need to have active, it needs to be active. It can't be one-sided because if I'm just talking and just listening to myself and you're just listening to what's in your head because you're waiting for my lips to stop so you can say what you have to say, we are not having a conversation with each other. We're having a conversation in our head. It's just out loud. So we want to think about some of the benefits of active listening. One, it enhances motivation because listening gives the leader the power and the ability to encourage and motivate employees. Moreover, a boss who actually listens stimulates his subordinates in reaching their maximal potential and at the same time they're ma maximizing that success because if i feel motivated if i feel like you are truly hearing me oh i'm going to go to the ends of the earth for you because i want i want to keep that feeling going people humans we are we resonate we are drawn to good feelings so if i can keep that good feeling going i'm going to do more i'm going to be more productive the other benefit is overcoming resistance because now i hear you I, you know, as a manager, we're having this two-way active conversation. You're hearing me, I'm hearing you. So now it's going to help me overcome the resistance because I'm actually listening to your fears. What are you scared of? Because the reason people resist is because their fear of change or their fear of whatever's going to come down the pike. So now let me listen to that and I can go ahead and address that in this conversation. So that's going to move us forward. Also, it saves time and money. You know why? Because I don't have to repeat myself. How many of us have been in a meeting and we leave that meeting and we don't know what we're supposed to do next? Let's see some hands. I am raising both hands because I've been in many a meetings where that has happened, where I'm looking at my colleagues like, OK, did you get the first 30 minutes or, you know, I got the last 30 minutes. I think she said we're supposed to do X, Y, Z. And they're like, no, we're supposed to do LMNOP, you know, so. If, if we have this active listening skill down, we won't have to repeat ourselves. We will be able to say it once, get, the, get everybody moving in the same direction. We're in the right seats, on the right bus, going in the right direction, headed towards the promised land. We're heading towards our goal. So those are the benefits. So let's talk about how do we get there? The first thing is how can we increase that active listening is, um, hello, ask questions. If you don't know, 
ask a question, raise your hand, say, hey, you know, I just want to make sure that I understand what you're saying. I want to make sure that I understand that I'm on the same page you are. And, you know, you can say something like, um, you know, can you back up a second? Because you don't want to interrupt the person. If the person is talking, you know, don't sit there and wait for their lips to close so you can so you can ask your question. Stay engaged in the conversation and say, excuse me, you know, can we back up a second? I didn't understand um, what you just said about X, Y, Z. So and also you want to make sure that when we're asking questions that we're staying on topic, because I know sometimes, especially I'll go over and talk to Cynthia. Cynthia is our great ben benchmarking specialist. So we have different uh, different communication style. Like I am very, you know, as you can tell, very expressive in my communication style. She is more analytical. And so I'm telling her a story about this fabulous trip that I took to the Virgin Islands and I'm talking about the sand and the water and the colors and everything. And she was like, oh, what, um, what, what temperature was it there? What was the water temperature? And so I'm like, what are you talking about the water temperature? And so then she goes into, because I was looking online and I read something about the water temperature and when it changes. And so now we're gone off on a whole different water temperature, weather meteorologist situation. And so we have gotten off topic of my fabulous Virgin Island vacation. That sometimes happens when we're talking about business as well, because people will sometimes get focused on one part of what you said. And now we're off to the races in a totally different direction. I like to say squirrel because I mean, like it just we just all of a sudden moved completely off. So you definitely want to ask questions, but try to make sure that they kind of stay on topic. Also, look for nonverbal clues. You know, excluding ex um, emails, the majority of direct communication is probably um, nonverbal. So be aware of your face. I know I went to Disney one time and I enjoy people watching. I just love it. I can sit. I was sitting down on a bench and I was just watching the people, the kids, everyone was just having a great time. I was having a lovely time. And one of the um, employees came over to me and said, excuse me, ma'am, you dropped something. And I have this. And now I have a confused look like what? What? And she was like, excuse me, you dropped something. I said, where? She was like, you dropped your smile. I thought that was the cutest thing. Well, I thought I was smiling because I really was having a great time. That situation right there gave me so much self-awareness. It made me realize that I have a not friendly resting face. You know, for some reason, even though internally I was happy and, you know, I had this childlike wonder of of lovely dreams and lollipops in my head. But apparently it was I was not, you know, looking that way. <laughs> so just make sure that you are aware of your nonverbal cl clues. That right there made me very aware where I always thought that I was smiling, but now I understand why people may, you know, not sit next to me <laughs> on the bench because I probably look mean, but I didn't, I didn't realize that. The next piece of how to increase is be attentive, but relax. So we want to give that eye contact. We want to look them in their eyes. We want, you know, we want the speaker to know that I'm engaged, but you don't want to have this pent intensive like stare, staring contest with the person in, at all. So you want to be attentive, but relax. So, you know, active listening definitely builds relationships. It solves problems. It ensures understanding and it can resolve conflicts because now we are, you know, we are both an active participant in this conversation and it's definitely going to improve accuracy. At work, effective listening means fewer errors, less wasted time, and active listening just builds relationships and it builds careers because we all are on the same page. So now that we know how to actively listen, let's talk about, oh, I'm sorry, and I forgot one last point on that active listening is summarize. Um, before we move on to the next component, you make sure you want to kind of go back and say, okay, this is what I heard you say. And, you know, especially if the conversation has some action points at the end of some, some things that we need to do and move forward, let's go ahead and summarize that conversation and say, okay, um, this was, this has been very beneficial. And I know that our next steps are going to be that I am going to make detailed notes in our CRM system. And we are going to log the calls of our, of our client advisors. Whatever the case may be, let's go ahead and summarize what those actionable items are. So when we leave, we are all on the same page and we don't have that, you know, whole thing of 
what what did they talk about in the meeting? What are we supposed to do next? So now we have that active listening piece. So now let's talk about self-awareness. You know, this little kitten, see, you know, it's only a kitten, but this kitten sees themselves as a lion. Well, this could be, you know, not beneficial for the little kitten if the kitten goes out thinking that it's a lion and no, you're really just a little kitten. You know, you, you really only weigh two pounds. So don't try to uh, attack some something or someone that weighs 400 pounds. You might get hurt. So you want to ensure that um, you have true self-awareness. And so, you know, the benefits of that self-awareness is that it improves your focus because, you know, as you develop yourself personally, now when you have that improved focus, now you are utilizing your strengths to your advantage. You understand what your challenges are because we all have challenges. You know, no one is perfect, but understanding what my strengths are, so I'm going to set myself up for success, focus on those strengths, and know how to compensate for those challenges. Also, it's going to help you to adapt. You know, personal development cannot prevent all bad things from occurring. It's going to happen. It's life. It's reality. But it will help you deal with them when they do because you know why? You know what your strengths are. You, you know how. So if something bad happens, well, how can my strengths help me out of this situation? Or how can my strengths help my company get out of this situation? This is what I can do. So now you can go to your boss. You can go to your manager saying, I know we're having this situation. I have, I have a strong um, knowledge of this, of, 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 of the issue, and I have some great solutions. How about this? And now you're having that con um, conversation. So it's going to help you cope. And then, it's, you know, when you become self-aware, you can definitely play to your strengths, and that can help you professionally also. So how do you become self-aware? Well, this is the Omnia group. So the Omnia report is, is number one on how you become self-aware. The Omni Report talks about your strengths, talks about your challenges. And, it, and we do it in a diplomatic way because we understand about authentic communication. So we communicate it authentically, but we do it diplomatically as well. Also, you can get some feedback from your peers because you know no one knows you better than the people that work with you, you know, eight hours a day. And then lastly is your management, is manager's feedback. So you want to get feedback from everywhere. And that's how you can really become self-aware. Like for me, that example of me at Disney, I thought that I had the biggest smile, the biggest Kool-Aid cheese grin that you could ever imagine. But I wasn't smiling at all, you know. So that person made me aware. So now when I am out, I think about, I mean, you know, because it's not my natural tendency, but I truly think about and try to have a more approaching look. I know with me, you know, from this, from my voice, you sound like, oh, Tanya is very approachable. But apparently at Disney, I was not. So becoming self-aware is key. And it starts with understanding yourself in that Omnia report. So now those are the components of authentic communication. And that is you know, the transparency, the active listening, and the self-awareness. Now, the last two components we're going to talk about is the emotional mind and the intellectual mind. And so when you're thinking about the emotional mind, the emotional mind is more about the heart. So you're coming from the heart. And the intellectual mind is more about coming from the head, basically. You need both. But as individuals, some of us are more naturally geared to one side or the other. So we're going to talk about both, and we're going to talk about the characteristics and the challenges that both of them have. So in re for the emotional mind, you, you focus on feelings, and then you focus on people. Because once again, you're coming from that heart piece. But what are some of the challenges that the emotional mind people have? And it's more so how they are perceived. Oh, those people are drama. I have conversations with my clients all the time in regards to their um, to an employee's Omni report. She just brings the drama all the time, Tanya. All she just, you know, she just comes in. It's just always good morning. How are you doing? She's just way too much. 
And so people sometimes view that as negatively. So that's the challenge for someone coming from the emotional side is to know how to not be viewed that way, how to calm that down a little bit. And then the strength, however, of that um, emotional mind is that they're empathetic. I mean, you know, they, they show that empathy. They, you know, they, they feel for the person. They un understand where that person is coming from. So you want, and once again, this about that self-awareness and utilizing the strength. So now let's talk about the intellectual mind people. The characteristics of them, they focus on the facts. It's all about, you know, what can be proven and they focus on the process. You know, what can, what is true, what is false, there is no gray in life, it's black or white, it's right or wrong. And so that's the part they come from. And so sometimes they are viewed as being impersonal or cold. I go in there, she never says hello to me. She's always just looking straight forward. I say good morning to her and she says nothing. She is just so cold. I don't even, I don't know how you work for her. You know, those are conversations that people are having and it's, and this person is very friendly, very nice. It's just that she's about the business. You know, she is about facts, figures, numbers. Like Cynthia, our, our benchmarking specialist, she is more on the intellectual mind side. But she is the friendliest, most genuine person that you would um, that, that you want to know. Like if anybody has had an experience with talking with her in regards to, you know, adding your positions or, or her dip, you know, diving into what exactly you're looking for or what exactly you're targeting for the Omnia profile, you can you you can speak to how great and she's very personable but sometimes you know those intellectual mind minded individuals it just takes them a little bit longer to warm up and then so the strength is that they're objective you know cynthia is not going to let the emotion of how much you love this person when you interview them cloud her judgment of what you truly need for this accountant position. Yes, you love this accountant, but when they completed the assessment, they have zero attention to detail. They want to be creative and think outside of the box. Well, raise your hand if you want a creative accountant, or you'd be raising your hand if you want to go, <laughs> if you want to get audited, because you can't really be creative with the numbers. It's either we have the money in the bank or we don't have in the money in the bank. It's not a, well, we kind of have money in the bank. You, We can't float checks or anything like that. So, you know, depending on, and with Cynthia, she doesn't let that, you know, cloud her judgment because I know you really love this person and they interviewed very well and they were, you know, the best thing since sliced bread, but this is what you're targeting and this is why you're targeting this person with high attention to detail because we don't want you to get audited because this person got creative with the numbers. So you just want to understand what the strengths are and what the, um, and what the challenges are for each person. And Scott, yes, the emotional mind people may tend to sugarcoat some because they want to soften the blow. And softening the blow is fine, but we still want to make sure that we're getting to the facts. So let's talk about the different type of communication style. So we kind of know where the people are coming from. Let's talk about how that may look in person, in the workplace. So you, we have relational um, communica uh, communication style individuals. And if you are familiar with the Omnia profile, you know that that's our column three individuals. So they are animated and, you know, gregarious, great at building relationships and rapport easily. And then we have on the other side, which are our column fours. The column fours are analytical, fact-oriented, speaks in specifics. These are the people that it's black or white, you know, it's like that old... Um, uh, show just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. You know, I don't need all that fluff. But when you have, when you're managing people, when you are dealing with people, you're going to deal with people that are relational as well as consultative. So when we're talking about authentic communication, we need to understand how to communicate the way that they respond. Yes, if you are a consultative, direct type of communicator, while that is your natural style, we are all adults and we can adapt. So we may, so we know that we may have to be a little bit more animated when we're talking to this individual. You know, I can um, when I'm counseling or consulting with my clients, I'll have a manager who is a, a really tall one four. So they're really that consultative, direct type of communicator. And so when those types of managers, they're more like, well, you got your paycheck, so you should know that you're doing a great job. I don't need to necessarily go out there and pat you on the back every time you pick up a fax from the fax machine. I mean, come on, you're here. I didn't fire you. You still have a desk and you can still log on to the computer. So thumbs up, you're doing an awesome job. 
that's how some managers, I mean, of course, that, that's an extreme, but some managers are, they don't necessarily offer up those kudos easily. So the, what I do is I suggest that they put four pennies, five pennies out on their desk on Monday morning. Then by Friday morning, the penny should be inside of your desk because that means you have given out four to five genuine compliments because no matter if you're relational or consultative, everybody wants to know that they're doing a great job, that their boss thinks that they are doing an A1, you know, great, awesome job. And so you have to communicate that to them. Just, you know, them being able to come in and log onto their computer every day is not necessarily the validation that they need. So if you are that for consultative, you want to ensure that you're going out giving those pats on the back. But then on the other side, when I'm talking to my relational managers, we don't all want, you know, the the rah rah rahs, you know, the pom poms, the ring in the bell. You know, we don't need, you know, if you are managing a bunch of consultative, that would be a little irritating every day to come in and you this person is on 10 every single morning like can you dial that down a little bit for me so if you're a relational type manager know that when you are congratulating your consultative individuals that you want to give some meat behind what you're saying so you know what shay you did an awesome job on that presentation i really like the way you had bullet points on each slide and that really resonated with our prospect so now Shay truly feels like I have validated her, that I have that I thought she was doing a great job because I gave her specific information of exactly what she did right. And so now that's something that she can hold on to. That is something tangible that she can touch, feel, see that, yes, she saw my bullet points. She saw that the prospect um, really resonated with that presentation. So for, on both sides, whether you're a three, communicating with the four we have to make some accommodations if you're a four or a consultative person communicating with the relational column three we have to make accommodations so understanding that and adapting our style is 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 key because each style has predictable strengths and blind spots and when you understand how these play together you will begin to collaborate with people to play to their strengths and to cover their blind spots also you'll you will no longer take it personally or be offended, you know, when someone bumps against your blind spot or someone says something to you. It's not personal when someone who has a high compliant to standard or more of that consultative type of communication style does not agree or, or excuse me, does not greet you with a warm hello or hug. And likewise, just on the, you know, the reverse side, when someone gives you a big warm hug the first time they see you, and, you know, you'll recognize, oh, so they're more of that relational person. So I know when I'm communicating to them, I need to kind of amp up my animation a little bit. So now let's talk let's talk about this a little bit more because I believe communication style and, you know, communication is one of the most important components when we're talking about authentic communication, when we're talking about keeping our employees engaged. We want to know you know, what do I need to do to keep them motivated, to keep them engaged in the process? So let's talk about engaging an expressive communicator. First, we want to mix it up. You know, expressive communicators, they like a lot of um, variety. They like a lot of, you know, wow. So if I'm, if I am someone that's not necessarily the expressive or the relational column three communicator, so I know I'm going to want to mix it up something, mix it up. One, because I need to be authentic, so I need to be me. And my me is that wild jazz hands. But I'm going to mix it up a little bit. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I'm sorry. When when you are a more analytical person talking with an expressive communicator, you're coming from a point of I need facts, figures, proof. So now I need to mix in a little bit of that wow, a little bit of that jazz hand so that expressive communicator can really buy into what I'm saying. Next is give them the opportunity to speak because, ex you know, expressive communicators, they like to talk. <laughs> and so, you know, you give them your facts and figures, but then give them an opportunity to express themselves. And then lastly, Think, you know, just because your expressive communicator makes jokes, don't treat them like one. Just because you think that they bring drama to the office, they don't necessarily bring drama to the office. They bring light. They bring levity. They bring a little bit of, you know, 
lightheartedness to the office. So they can be very serious. They can be about their business. They can be about their work. They can be very knowledgeable. They can be subject matter experts on a variety of topics just because they have fun when they're doing it, just because they have fun when they're presenting the information doesn't mean that they don't know exactly what they're talking about. And then when we're talking about engaging a consultative communicator, so this is more of that analytical um, type of communicator. The first thing we want to think about is, you know, giving them advance warnings. Consultative communicators are fueled more by their inner thoughts and reflections than by necessarily social engagement and interactions with others. And so, you know, you don't want to put them on the spot for an answer or an opinion. They definitely have one, but, you know, you want to give them time to formulate their thoughts. If you want to get the best out of a consultative type of communicator, then it's best not to demand it immediately. If you're going to have a meeting and you know in that meeting you want to talk about your initiatives for 2017, send out the agenda beforehand. Let them know the questions that you're going to ask. You're going to have a much more productive meeting because consultative communicators do not like being put on the spot because they want to be able to think about it, research it, make sure that they're coming from a place that they can back up with what what they're saying. So if if you you know try to put me on the spot about it, I'm not going to be for sh I'm not I'm not sure if I really know. Well, this is the initiative that we should do, but I don't know if I've done enough research, so I'm just not going to say it and just say no. I really don't have anything that you know that I think we should be doing. But if you gave me an hour, two hours, a day, oh, I could come up with the laundry list of what I think we did the direction I think we should be moving towards. Also, give time for relationships to form. Consultative communicators don't usually form them quickly. They may appear harder to get to know, but then they do connect. They are loyal and with a deep, intimate connect connections. I mean, these are strong connections typically when you're um, and when you engage a consultative communicator and they can actually be quite fun and even silly at times like Cynthia you know she is our consultative communicator but you know she she will come in with her Bahama mama um fun shirts when we're doing when we have employee engagement and you know we have a uh, decade days where you know she came in as Michael Jackson one time or you know so she can have fun the consultative communicators can let their hair down and be loose but it just takes them a little bit longer to do that so understand that about them and then lastly you want to use written communication when available they often prefer email or text than over the phone they are usually more engaging when they can write out their thoughts ahead of time so, you know, if, you, if you're emailing Cynthia, she will give you the, the best email in regards to why you're selecting this tall column eight for, for your accountant or why, you know, this networker as a salesperson may not be the best because they'll be great at getting business cards but not necessarily closing business. So, you know, communicating with her via email is and she, she, she will give you a lot of information. This is not to say that she can't give it to you over the phone because she also will express that information over the phone as well because she knows the product like the back of her hand. That's also when we're talking about consultative communicators. When they are subject matter experts, which Cynthia is, even on the phone, she will give you a lot of information because she knows the product. You know, she, she knows the science behind why we build what we build, you know, why we made the columns what we made them. And, and if, I, if she comes from a point of knowledge and knowing that she knows the, um, the analytics behind it, you will have an hour conversation with her in regards to all the information, the wealth of knowledge that she has. And so when we're talking about you know, being authentic and keeping them engaged. We talked earlier about what are the obstacles that prevent, you know, us, us personally being authentic. So now let's talk about what prevents it in the workplace. And there's just, you know, a few obstacles that have the barriers, I like to call them. One, it could be the culture. I mean, you know, it may be the organizational structure just doesn't have doesn't have the infrastructure to have that authentic communication, meaning that you say you have an open door policy, but your door is never really open. 
even though you know you may have it open literally but we all know yeah don't go in Tanya's office even though it's open she doesn't really have a, an open door policy so making sure that your culture you know what's around you is is opening up to authentic communication that's made available also make sure that the languages you know that we use is um, is authentic it like I said it's like what our moms used to say it's not necessarily what you say it's how you say it so make sure we're communicating that and then also the another obstacle for authentic communication is you're dealing with a lot of different personalities you're dealing with a lot of different behaviors and, and if we don't know how to harness that if we don't know how to recognize and celebrate the differences it can become problematic so let's kind of break this down a little bit further when we talk about work culture leadership is the main aspect of um, cultural obstacles it's the negative attitudes of top management negative attitudes of top management management discourages communication initiatives of the employees if I know that you don't want you know I'm not supposed to come in I'm not going to come in and also if we have a bunch of layers of management excessive authority layers acts as a sever and it and it impedes communication because if I have to talk to you you have to talk to her she has to talk to him he has to talk to her you know okay that's just way too much it's a bunch of red tape nothing nothing is going to get done and then by the time that cycles back down to me it's not going to be the, the real message because we've all played that whisper game as a child and when it came back around it was nothing like what we thought it was going to be and that leads to that misrepresentation of information because I you know sent up that I want to do X Y and Z but somehow when it got to top management it came out that no Tanya doesn't like to train at all Tanya doesn't like to have webinars at all and the real message was I love training I love webinars I want to do more of those but for some reason when it got to top management that the message was wrong so if we have too many layers things like that can happen so we want to kind of lessen some of those layers and we want to make sure that we're that we're not playing the whisper game and it's going awry in our organization next is that language obstacle that I talked about so you know let's talk about let's say and I'll go ahead and let y'all type this in you gave me a project and I said okay group I will get back with you shortly how many minutes or how many hours or how many days do you think that I will get back to you shortly means so go ahead and type in so you gave me this Excel spreadsheet and you want me to um, sort it and you want me to color code it and I said okay group I'll get this back to you shortly when do you expect me to get it back to you Diane sh says within 24 hours Enrique says same day Shay says oh Shay's giving me the next couple of days I'm working for Shay because I, I like Shay's time frame by the end of the day same day it's too open-ended I would strive for same day there you go Kelly Kelly perfect it is too open-ended if you don't give me you know as you can see everybody had a different opinion of what what shortly means to me shortly actually means I should see it in about 60 minutes I mean shortly to me is an hour so we want to make sure that we don't have language obstacles when we are assigning projects when we, when we are assigning goals we want to attach a time frame to that so we're all on the same page because the shortest was me at 60 minutes Shay gave us two days so now we don't know when we're supposed to get that Excel spreadsheet done because it's just up in the air so we want to make sure that we're not creating obstacles or barriers because of the, diff the way we interpret things lastly are those personality obstacles you know we have a lot of different people in our organization and so you know one is that fear the fear of reprisal we talked about that so fear of criticism for knowing very little you know it may create problems in communication if you don't give that consultative individual enough a heads up they're not going to participate so that's going to be a barrier in regards to keeping them motivated keeping them engaged and getting that authentic communication also categorizing or you know stereotyping making assumptions and stereotypes can go both ways you can have this employee you know and they're about to get promoted and so their manager comes to you and say Tanya what do you think about Chris 
And you say, oh, Chris, he comes in all the time. He's on, he's on time. He has a perfect attendance. So he is a great worker. He is wonderful. So what I have done is because Chris comes in on time, has a perfect attendance, I have already said and stereotyped him as a great or categorized him as a great employee. Chris may come in at 9 o'clock every day, but he's on Facebook at 9.01. So, I mean, so sometimes we have that halo effect and we can categorize people that way. So stereotypes can work both ways. So we want to make sure that we truly are looking at what the person is. And I'm sure Chris is a wonderful employee and Chris never gets on Facebook. Thank you for letting me utilize you as an example, Chris. The last piece is perceptual differences. We all perceive things in unique ways because you remember what happens is what's underneath that water line is what's driving our expectations, our communications, or how we perceive things. So we want to make sure that we understand that and that we are aware of that. And then the last piece that really will help um, in regards to authentic communication, in regards to engaging our employees is understanding what the trust killers are. You know, of course, you know, trust killer number one is focus only on you. Look out for number one. Let's face it. Please, no one is more important than you. You're the center of the universe. If you don't look out for yourself, who will? So make sure you get yours and forget about everybody else and they can just get what's left over. If people think that you are only looking out for yourself, they will never let down their guard. So they will never trust you. You will never get to that authentic place. And if you can't get to that authentic place, authentic place, you'll never necessarily get to that engagement, that motivating piece, because everybody has their walls up. So you really won't know what's truly motivating them. The second one is say one thing and do another. Tell people that you have an open door policy, but never let anyone in. You know, like my mom and my dad always told me, actions speak louder than words. So if you say you're going to do it, you need to do it. Um, don't just put it out there and never follow up. Lastly, take credit for all the good, but point fingers when things go wrong. Yeah, go ahead. Take the credit for everything good that happens on your team. Point out the mistakes to others. Let management know who dropped the ball. Hey, they can't get better if they don't know where they need to improve, so I need to tell everybody about it. That's not really true. I mean, yes, we want to hold people accountable, but you definitely don't want to take credit for everything. This is a team effort. There's no I in team, so everyone should feel like the piece that they're playing, the piece that they put into this process is being recognized because what do all employees want? They want that recognition. And so I want to thank you all for joining me today. You can go ahead and type in questions if you have any questions. I know when I presented this topic before, the question I get most is, how can you be authentic and not hurt people's feelings? There are, you know, you want to remember, the best way to do that is always to remember intent. Um, if you come from a good place, then what you communicate will, will be perceived that way. Don't come from a negative place. Don't come from a place of trying to hurt. So always think about your intent. And the way you can kind of build on that, build on that intent, and build on where, where your strengths are, where your challenges are, is, un, is the Omnia um, the Omnia report, you know, authentic communication improves when you keep learning about yourself, be aware of your own judgments and prejudices, as well as your strengths and challenges, and then expand that thought out to your team. That's why we have these developmental reports, a leadership, a sales style, a customer service, a professional development report. These reports are written to be shared so we can all be on the same page. If I know what your communication style is, I'm going to be able to motivate you a lot better. If I know what your communication style is, you know what mine is, we're going to have a more dynamic, more well-rounded uh, team. We're going to be firing on all cylinders because no one's trying to hurt someone or no one, you know, we all know that I may be direct, but I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. It's, that's just the way I communicate so I can accept that. Authentic communication has a benefit to not only the leaders but to the employees because we're all on the same page. I want to thank everyone um, for joining me today. And speaking of authentic communication and you and building trust with the people that are on the are, that are on this call, I want to share something with you. It's a little secret. We are launching a brand new website here shortly. 
Um, it's going to be, be launched in, in a couple of weeks. So you're getting a little preview. So this is building that trust with the with um, the participants of the website. We're also launching an, an applicant tracking system that's going to be available to you as well. So I'm just giving you kind of a sneak preview of what this looks like. Uh, we have some webinars that are coming up to kind of introduce our clients to this new website. So I definitely ask you to participate in those webinars. They're, on the left side of your screen. If you have not experienced the Omnia profile, if you are not a current client and want to truly experience understanding your true communication style, building on that authentic, um, making, uh, having your communication style be authentic, building on your team, definitely um, send me an email and we can get that set up for you so you can experience what it is to speak authentically, to understand what your strengths and challenges are. This is my email at the top right t devane at omniagroup.com once again i want to mention the three webinars that we're going to be hosting um throughout the year where um it's only open till to 30 people because it's going to be very interactive we're going to be able to take a deep dive at your actual um style uh, your pace your level of assertiveness your communication style your level of structure and you get a free, um, excuse me, a report is included in this, um, in those webinars. So they're, they are $39.99, um, but you do get your actual report as well. And so, um, and plus, there's just a wealth of information. Once you understand about yourself, as we talked about with authentic communication, it really starts with understanding who you are. So those are very beneficial as well. Please register for those, and you know there, it's only open for 30 people, so you get to get in first if you click right now. Also, next month we will have toxic, toxic employees when conflicts can be resolved. We all have that conflict resolution. We all have that one employee that's like, how can I, how can I help them? Help me, help us, so we don't have to have these confrontations, and I don't get called into HR every week. So definitely tune in for that as well. Um, I want to, again, thank everyone for joining me today. Uh, thank you for your comments. I'm kind of going up and see if there are any additional questions that may be.